The number one request in my office is this. Pray for my lost children. That's number one. Our lost family. Husbands, wives, sons, and daughters. Everyone in this room right now that has a lost loved one, please raise your hand all over this room and hold it there for a moment. Now, if you think tonight this meeting does not have need, you look around. I believe I can safely say 99% of this crowd has their hands raised. Now, listen to me closely. It wasn't but a short time ago that the Lord brought something back to my memory. When I began to deal with the number one problem, a woman told me in a rally in Phoenix that she had just buried her son. She said, Brother Thompson, I know where my son is tonight. My son is in hell. I know where my son is tonight. He's in hell. Every person in this room that raised your hands, if God does not intervene, the one for whom you raised your hand will go to hell. Here is the question. We can believe for our healing and our own salvation, but are our hands tied regarding your children? Are we simply to sit back with our hands folded and say whatever will be, will be? Are we at the mercy of this satanic force, like Jan was talking about, that had her help in bondage? You need to realize that you have something to say about it. And everything that God does, he does it through you. And anybody that tells you that you can do nothing about your lost family has not spoken the word of God. For tonight in this room, Satan's plans will be exposed. And you're entering into a plan with God and fully expect to set forth in motion a celebration party because you are going to celebrate. Start thinking how big it's going to be now because your sons and daughters and mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and husbands and wives and grandma and granddaddy and aunts and uncles that think they're going to get away from God permanently, set it in motion, you are going to have a celebration party for those that are lost are going to be found in the name of Jesus Christ. Nineteen hundred and seventy, December the 6th. I was standing in a room in Fort Worth, Texas, at the Owens Brumley Funeral Home. I can talk about this now easier than I used to could. Nobody was in that room but me and the remains of one that I loved, and his name is Rex. Rex is my brother. He is and was my very best friend. We were close. We grew up together. And at the age of 29, on December the 5th, he's involved in an automobile accident. December the 6th, 11 hours, 45 minutes later, on a Sunday morning, in Tyler Memorial Hospital in Tyler, Texas, the doctor came from the room and said, I'm sorry, he's gone. December the 8th, we had his funeral. And December the 7th, I'm standing in Owens and Bromley Funeral Home. I walk over and I close the door. I want to be alone with my thoughts. And I want to talk to him. Can he hear me? I don't know, but I did anyway. My mind went back as I sat in a chair beside the remains of my brother, and I talked to him as if we were there, because that's what we always did. We talked a lot. When Zonel and I were dating... The early part of that, I was away from God. I had rebelled against God. I was far from God. I was breaking the hearts of my parents. I loved them deeply. But I wanted to live my life, and I wanted to do it my way. My brother, all of these years, as far as I know, for the most part of it, had lived a very good life. And if there's ever one calling he had, it was the calling of intercession. I sat in that room and I thought about the event that took place that had it not been for that event, I would not be standing on this platform tonight. My brother told me after the event when he prayed for me, 
He told me much later. He said, Dwight, he said, one night the Lord awoke me. He awoke me and suddenly he said, I saw you dying in a car wreck. And from that car wreck, you were going into hell. And I literally saw the flames of hell. This is what he told me later. He said, immediately the Lord spoke to him and said, if you don't stand in the gap for Dwight, he's going to hell. That was an act of mercy, wasn't it, to tell my brother that. Because you see, God works through his people. Immediately, Rex said, I woke up and the sweat was pouring off of my face, and it was about 3.30 in the morning, and I raced into your room, which is next to mine, and you were not there. He said, immediately I fell down next to the bed. God said, if you will hold on to me in his behalf and stand in the gap, I will save him. That's what he told me later. About four in the morning, I came home, and that morning, I remember the first morning, my brother entered into a covenant with God. And this is what it was. He said, I will hold on to God until he is saved. And I will pray until he gives his heart to God. He will not rest. That's what he told me later. He said, I made up my mind right. You're not going to rest. You're not going to enjoy being in this house because I'm going to pray you into the kingdom. The first night that my brother prayed, I will always remember it. Because between our two rooms is nothing but a wall and a door that squeaks. You've got to understand something. My brother already was a weightlifter. And he had won uh, several trophies in his class for weightlifting. So he could do anything he wanted to do. And I didn't dare come test it too much unless I had me a two before or a crowbar. And the crowbar, I still think he could have bitten it in two. I'm glad I never found out and incurred his wrath upon me. That night he prayed, and I'll never forget, well, this is unusual, he's never done it quite that loud, but my brother has massive hands. I don't advise this for everybody, I'm just telling you what the Lord instructed me to tell you tonight, but this is the way he prayed. His hand, I really think, was about twice the size of mine, and he enjoyed when he prayed, I don't know why he did it, he liked to bang on something. Now call it emotion, whatever you want to, but his prayers got answered, so who's going to knock it? I can still see him in church praying, and he has a low baritone voice, but if you can believe this, it can get louder than mine. I know you find that hard to believe. But he would pray, and when he would pray sometimes, he would bring his hand up like this and come down on the altar, my dad's church. Well, heads would just bob up and down that altar, because you know what that can do to you if you're leaning over on that altar praying. But, he'd, you know, when he'd get to praying, just clear aside, boy. I don't know if he's doing his number on a devil's head or what, but he's praying. Well, that's the way it was. Well, Rex got next to me, and this is the way he prayed. He told me later. He didn't say anything about it then. That door would squeak, and he would start praying. And that boy would pray most of the time, at least for two to three hours. And since I didn't get in till 3 o'clock in the morning, you can pretty well guess that that was until daylight. Well, when I would come in tired, I would lay down. Well, he would give me just enough time to get comfortable. Now, the door between us would squeak. And he would always start praying in a very intelligent way. And by that I mean he had a vocabulary second only to Webster. He was the second highest graduate in one of the largest universities uh, in Fort Worth, Texas. So he was a very intellectual young man. But when the Spirit took over, he just cranked right on that intellect into the power of the Holy Ghost, and it made quite a combination. So he could use words that even I didn't know what he was talking about. But when he clicked in the Spirit, man, it just took over with spiritual brute force. And he'd start praying. And he'd beat on the wall. Or he'd hit the door. And I'm trying to sleep. Every pillow that I could get on my head couldn't sound it out. I am not teasing you when I say every picture in the house would be crooked by morning. Well, this went on for one night, two nights, three nights, four nights. My brother was a man that liked to keep records. He's been that way all of his life. So what I didn't know then, he had made up his mind that he was going to log every day. And ever how many days it took and the hours that he prayed, that's what he was going to do. Now, I want to stop right here and interject this. 
instead of yelling at him and screaming at him and say, you're killing me and you're going to go to hell and this and that, why don't you just love them? Because that's not going to change them. Condemning them, what I'm saying to you tonight, is not going to change them. And what you're really doing is you're being offended at the way they're living. It makes you feel like a failure because they're not living for God as you are. But that will not get them into the kingdom. You have to make tonight, listen to me, an unqualified commitment to God that you are going to love your children into the kingdom of God and hold on to the horns of the altar in intercession, standing in the gap for them. Now let me say this right here. What does that mean, standing in the gap? What does it mean to stand in the gap? That's what Abraham did for Sodom. Abraham said, Lord, don't destroy Sodom. If I can find 50 men, will you spare them? God said, I will. He couldn't find them. He said, if I can find 40, God said, I'll spare them. He couldn't. He said, if I can find 10, God said, I would spare Sodom if you can find 10 righteous men. But he could not find them. But the Bible says in Genesis 19 that God remembered Abraham and spared Lot. God remembered Abraham and spared Lot. And the Bible said he even sent angels in and took Lot by the hand and jerked him out of that place. And the same day, fire and brimstone fell upon that city. In my hand tonight, in this little box alone, and there are probably a thousand more in this room, people have brought pictures of their loved ones. Pictures of their loved ones that they want to see born into the kingdom of God. How many times has every one of these children come up in front of you parents' eyes and the devil said, I've got them and I'm going to kill them. I'll destroy them. But I want you to know we've entered into an agreement tonight with you that there's no way in the world that that enemy is going to kill that child just like Dad Bethany did for Jan when those demon forces have been endeavoring to destroy them and obliterate their life from the face of the earth. I see right now that the Spirit of Almighty God is lifting up a standard against that satanic force trying to kill them. And I even see the Holy Spirit through our prayers that is coming down on the neck of that enemy that's trying to kill that child. Look for these children and sons and daughters and mothers and daddies and husbands and wives to be saved because the devil will not, he cannot because we're standing in the gap for these children to be born into the kingdom of God. He shall not kill them. Listen to me now in closing. For 90 days, Rex Thompson prayed for his brother named Dwight Thompson. I got so mad. Are you with me? You know where I am? I got so mad at that boy that there were times that I threatened to go in there and get it on with him. I said I got mad, but I was not insane. It just wasn't a good idea. If you were a 900-pound gorilla, I'd still think about it. So he'd go in there and he'd pray through this squeaking door. My brother would. He prayed for me 90 days. That got so old for 90 days. Can you imagine coming in nearly at daylight and the only chance you're going to get to sleep is a few hours and your brother starts praying for you? And then he gets into this low voice and he starts praying so loud and he's beating on the wall and the windows are shaking and I'm going bananas in there with a hangover and he's praying and praying and praying and praying and praying and, praying and you're trying to sleep. It's hard to do. I told my mother some mornings, I said, Mama, I'm going to tell you something. We've all had pretty good peace in this house. If you don't tell Rex Jordan to quit that praying and quit bugging me at night, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to punch him out. And I can still hear my mother saying, Now, Dwight, we've taught you not to fight. Now, don't you talk like that about your brother. He loves you. And under her breath all the time, she was one of the conspirators saying, Go, Rex, go, 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 go. All the time. And while I'm sitting there in that Owens Bromley funeral home looking at my precious brother's remains, all this is going over in my mind. Well, that boy prayed 90 days, and, and I mean 90 days and nights, he held on to God for me. He stood in the gap. I was on my road to hell, but my little brother stood in the gap for his brother. Man, I wasn't heavy to him. I'm his brother. And so every morning, it seemed like at the table, when I'd get there, if I showed up for breakfast, he had been praying all night, and he kept me up all night, and he would come in there, and he'd bang my shoulder like this, because he always did He's rough. He'd say, how you doing, Dwighty? I finally told my dad, I said, Dad, I've got rights in this house. 
I am afforded rights of peace. You make Rex shut up and quit all that praying. He'd say, now, son, if the Lord's led your brother to pray, you never want to interrupt with God. And my daddy was in on it, too. The whole bunch was in on it. When you stand in the gap, are you listening to me tonight? When you stand in the gap, something is going to happen. That kid, he prayed and he prayed and he prayed and he prayed. And one night I came in. It had been 90 days. I didn't know it then. I did later. 90 days to the day. And on the 90th day, he opened that door and he started praying. And he did it like everything. He'd start low with that beautiful baritone voice. He had a beautiful voice. He sung, Oh, love of God, like nobody you could hear in your life. And then he would just, he'd just move off into this other thing. I didn't mind the, the intellectual praying. But when he got off into the spirit thing, talk, praying in this heavenly language and beating on the wall, that's too far. Do you know what? Can you understand where I'm coming from? And the wall thing, he nearly broke the hinges off of the door. When the anointed had come over, I guess it was like Jan's did. He told me at times he literally wrestled demons and devils. And I want to tell you something. It sounded like to me he was wrestling with 14 gorillas in his room some night because there was bodies slamming against the wall. And I really believe he was fighting demons off of my soul. Thank God for my little brother. Thank God for my brother. That 90th day, that boy, he started praying, started beating on the wall, you know, like he always did. And all of a sudden, he just quit. And you know how that does? That makes you raise up and think, well, what's happened to the man? I thought, you mean after all these time, I'm going to get a night's rest? And I heard him sobbing heavily. He was carrying many hours in college, see. So he was having to cram and work, and then when I come in, he had to start his praying, and then he'd have to go to school all day, and this is the way he did it. So between all this, he's carrying me. He carried me. That's just what he did. God showed me one day he carried my soul, and he refused to let Satan have my soul. And he cried. And this is what he said. I heard him say these words. Oh, God, I told you I will not stop praying until you save, Dwight. But I really am tired. And I do need a little encouragement in it. Would you just save him kind of in a hurry? And man, I heard him say that. He said, but I will pray until he is saved if it takes me the rest of my life. And I will tell you this much. That night, how I know prayer works, something came over me so strong I cannot explain it to you. But all I remember was I felt heaving from my soul. I felt sick physically, but it was spiritual. And suddenly my sins were crying out against me, and I cried out, Oh, God, I need you. I need you. And that night I cried out, God, forgive me. God, forgive me. And boy, that night every light in the house was on. My mom and dad came roaring in there, and my brother came in there. And I'll tell you, I was crying out to God like a house on fire. I was crying out, oh, God, forgive me. And my little old brother came in. You've got to remember what this boy looks like. He's 45 inches in the chest, and he has a 29-inch waist. He looks just like this. If you know what 19 inches around your forearm looks like, that's what my brother had, 19 inches. He could, he could military press over 360 pounds. That's standing up, snapping it right over your head like it's a match stem. Well, he came in there, and I'm praying out to God. Man, I mean, the lights are on. It's daylight. And my brother's got his arms around me. He had worked this arm around me like this, and he had this one around me like this, and he was squeezing me. And he was saying, that's it, Dwighty. Tell it to God. And so I was crying out, oh, God, save me. And when I'd say that, he'd squeeze me. Well, man, every rib was breaking. The man was going to kill me. I mean, I thought that he prayed me into the kingdom, and to make sure I didn't backslide, I thought he was going to kill me so I'd go to heaven. I finally said, Daddy, tell him to turn me loose. He's going to break my ribs. And so we're all praising the Lord, praising the Lord. And God, after 90 days, heard the prayer of my brother that would not let my soul go to hell. But he stood in the gap for his brother. And that's why tonight I'm preaching at the Anaheim Convention Center. I had a praying brother.